Algebra 3, Chapter 5, Section 5, Exponential and Logarithmic Models. Okay, there's five types of models that we're going to be looking at. First is the exponential growth model. The equation for exponential growth is y equals a times e to the bx, where b is greater than zero. If b is not greater than zero, if it's um, negative, then it's going to be a decay model. Here's an example. Y equals e to the x is the most basic one you can have, and this is what it looks like. Notice with exponential growth, the growth starts off slow, but increases in speed as time goes on. Also note that the graph has one horizontal asymptote, and that is at y equals zero. We also have an exponential decay model. The equation is similar to the growth model, except this time b has a negative out in front. Now b is still a positive number, but you're going to have a negative in front of it. It's a little confusing, but anyway, the idea is you're going to have a negative on that exponent. y equals e to the negative x is the most basic one you can have, and here's what it looks like. Notice that the decay, again, like growth, starts off slowly and gains speed. Decay starts off quickly, goes downhill very quickly, and then over time levels off. It also has a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. We have the Gaussian model. The equation is y equals a times e to the negative x minus b squared over c. And here's a basic example of that. Um, don't have a lot of extras in it. It's just y equals e to the negative x squared. And it looks something like this. And again, notice that we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. A little bit about Gaussian models. We've already talked about exponential growth and decay, so that's why we didn't spend time on those. But a Gaussian model forms a curve that is known as a bell-shaped curve. The curves are used in statistics to describe normal distributions. A standard normal distribution will take this form, y equals one over two pi, square root of two pi, times e to the negative x squared over 2. The average value of the population is the x value that goes with the maximum y value of the function. So 50% of the population is above this value and 50% are below. So if you think um, an example would be um, intelligence measurement, you have a middle ground that you expect 50% to be above and 50% to be below that. Okay, we also have the logistic model. The equation looks something like this. y equals a over 1 plus b times e to the negative rx. An example would be y equals 3 over 1 plus e to the negative 5x. And here's what the graph would look like. Um, this actually has two horizontal asymptotes. It has one at y equals 0. This one has one at y equals 3. That asymptote, the top one, is going to be whatever a is, whatever that top number is. The logistic model is useful for describing um, population growth in a region. A lot of times we use exponential growth, but the problem is that it's not realistic. Because if you think of an environment, there comes a point when the environment cannot sustain further growth. So the growth of the population will slow down and level off. And that upper asymptote, in this case y equals 3, is what is, um, it's the maximum population that you can have. And you can think about this in, in a real small environment, like think of a fish tank. You can only contain so many fish in a healthy, um, that are going to be healthy in a given sized fish tank. If you go above that, you're going to start losing fish. They're going to die out. The population is going to level off uh, in response to what the environment can provide for that number of uh, people, animals, whatever. They tend to be more real life than an exponential model because exponential models of growth is unrestricted. A logistic curve starts like exponential growth but then slows down levels off into what is considered the maximum sustainable population. It gives us two asymptotes and this function is sandwiched in between them and a logistic curve is also sinusoidal. It's also called a sinusoidal curve. Then we have the logarithmic model. The equation looks like one of these two, a plus b to times the natural log of x, 
or a plus b times the log of x. Some examples, uh, this would be 1 plus the natural log of x, 1 plus the common log of x. So those are our, legit, our logarithmic models. Note that both graphs have a vertical asymptote, and that is going to be 0. So this is the only one we've had where we have a vertical instead of a horizontal asymptote. All the others had horizontals. Now we're going to do some problems. Complete the table assuming continuously compounded interest. Remember the formula for that is principal times e to the rt power. Pause the recording, give this a try, and resume to check your answer. Okay, you may be puzzled about, um, you know, they, they want us to find time, and they gave us the principal, and then it said time to double. Well, if your principal is $1,000, then in the end, when it doubles, you're going to have 2000 So you use that for your final amount, put everything in, and then solve. Divide by 1000 and we have e, uh, 2 equals e to the 0.035t. Take the natural log of both sides, and then solve, and you get about 19.8 years. Now that we know um, the time it takes to double, we can do the next one here. We've got a equals 1000e to the 0.035 times 10, because uh, it's amount after 10 years, so this time we do know the time. It's about $1,419.07. Determine the principal that must be invested at the given rate, compounded monthly, so that $500,000 will be available for retirement in, ten, in T years. Um, so your formula is going to be A equals P times, now put in parentheses, 1 plus R over N, close your parentheses, and then the power on that is N times T. Okay, pause the recording, give this a try, and resume to check your answer. Okay, here's our formula again, and, and by the way, if you didn't catch that when I read it, and you need to pause it here now that you see it, go ahead. Um, if not, continue, and we'll go through the answer. Okay, putting all the numbers in, it looks like this. And then what we did was we basically divided both sides by all that mess that's next to P, and you get $303,580.52. Okay, now you're going to determine the time necessary for P dollars to double. So if you're starting with 1,000, remember you're going to go to 2,000. And interest rate R compounded annually, monthly, daily, and continuously. So you're going to use the formula um, for A, B, and C. You're going to use the formula we used on the last problem. And then for D, you're going to use the PERT formula. Pause the recording, give it a try, and resume to check your answer. Okay, so for n equals 1, one uh, that's annually, we find that it's going to be 7.27 years. When n is 12, this is part b, monthly, we get 6.96 years. When it's 365, we get 6.93 years. And continuously actually is the same as 365 in this case. That won't always be true, but this time it is. Okay, now you're going to complete this table. This time we're going to use our radioactive decay model. Uh, so it's going to be y equals, uh, I think it's ae to the negative bt. Okay, so we have the half-life. We have the initial quantity, so, um, and then we have the amount, and we're trying to find the amount left after 1,000 years. So, by the way, initial quantity kind of looks like it says log. It says 10 G, 10 grams. Okay, so that's going to be your principal. And what you're going to have to do first is you're going to have to figure that B out. So you know that, you know what the half-life is. You know that it's going to have 5 grams left. When T is 1,599, you're going to use that to find B, and then you're going to put that back in the equation and find out how much you've got left after 1,000 years. Pause the recording, give it a try, and resume to see how you did. 
All right, so like I said, we're going to set it up where we have five grams left after 1,599 years. We use that to find B, and we get that B is negative natural log of 0.5 over 1599. Now, you may wonder, why didn't we just put that in our calculator and round it? Well, if we can wait until we get our final answer, uh, it's going to give us a far more accurate answer. So we're just going to put that a whole mess in for B. So Y equals 10 times E. You see the power there, and we get 6.48 grams. Okay, the amount of time in hours per week a student utilizes a math tutoring center roughly follows the normal distribution, and they're giving us uh, the equation where X is the number of hours. By the way, 4 is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to 7 means X is a number that is between 4 and 7. You're going to use your graph to graph it and then estimate the average number of hours per week that the student uses the tutoring center. The average number of hours is going to be um, the, the peak of that graph. So pause the recording, give this a try and resume to check your answer. The top of the curve, let's see, there's the curve, represents the average or the 50% mark, and when you graph it, it appears to be between 5.25 and 5.5 hours, so about 5.375. Yeah, you can actually use the calculate max on your graph to get that. A site where electronic communications equipment is placed in a cellular network for the use of mobile phones. The numbers Y of cell sites from 1985 through 2011 can be modeled by uh, the logistic equation we see there, where T represents the year, with T equals 5 corresponding to 1985. So in other words, if we're talking about the year 1988, we're going to use 3 for T instead of 1988. So 0, your 0, T equals 0 year would be 1980. Use the model to find the number of cell sites in the years 1998, 2003, and 2006. So for 1998, you're going to use 18. Uh, for 2003, you're going to use 23, and then 26 for 2006. And then you're going to graph the function and determine when the number of cell sites reaches 250,000. Pause the recording, give this a try, and resume to check your answer. Okay, so there we go for 18, 23, and 26. And using the graph, uh, we get 30.6, so sometime in the year 2010. Okay, we have the Richter scale formula here. And what we're going to do is find the intensity of an earthquake. So I sub zero is one. So really it's log of I over one. And what you're going to do is you're going to find I the intensity for these three earthquakes. Pause the recording, give this a try and resume to check your answer. Okay, the intensity for the South Shetland Islands was 3,981,072. For Oklahoma was 12,589,254. And for Papua New Guinea, I think we might be missing something here. So I think this answer kind of got cut off. Um, but if you follow that, put 10, let's see, it's 10 to the 5.6. And that would give you... No, it's right. I'm sorry. 398,107.